good morning to our show. Today is uh, Flat Father standing instead of me. Father Doug, you want to introduce it? Well, good morning, Father Jose. You're looking a little flat today. What did you ruffle your hair during the night? Whoa, oh, you took a fall. What? <laughs> oh. what was that? Oh, no. Hey, uh, Father, you want to take care of the, the, our, our, our ill? I tell you, you know, the, the real issue with poor Flat Father here is that, you know, people say, Flat Father, you walk kind of funny. And of course he does. Look, he's got a, he has to have this stick between his legs. And so they say, why does Flat Father walk funny? Well, he's got this, he has to walk on this stick. So of course he's, he's just a little bit lame. So don't, you know, don't worry when Flat Father kind of keels over at times because he, he really is kind of a tricycle Flat Father there. He's got got his two legs plus that plus that that stick in the middle which I think really puts him at a disadvantage so every now and again just right in the middle of a of whatever he's gonna keel over just and we'll just have to deal with it oh, are you man. talking about the flat father or the real right. father was it well you know just say yes you and I you and I have to be very careful about what we reveal about the real father Jose but so we'll just leave it we'll with, leave it at the we'll flat just father. leave it with regard to okay. flat father Okay. Oh, boy. Hey, right. But um, I think that's it, it was a perfect intro. It was not planned. Father flat, fall flat on the floor. And uh, I think it's just a sign that we're called, we're, we're called to talk about martyrs today. There you go. Uh, Good so, transition. Man down. <laughs> ta -da, ta -da. So you're striving uh, to be a martyr today? Well, I just did. I died for the faith. Uh, oh. uh, trying to present that, that I thought I was going to be able to stand behind the camera and Father Flat was going to stay here, but uh, it didn't. So, Scott called me back, so I, I'm back. I'm back to life now. Okay. So, um, good morning. We hope you're doing uh, uh, good today. It's kind of a cloudy day, but it's, 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 it's good. We're alive. God is here. And um, today we're blessed to be able to like remember two great martyrs. And uh, we, as as the team talked about, like whenever there's a saint, like to talk about the saint and and the life and the history and, and why uh, he or she became a saint. And today it happened that we're, we're having today we celebrate two saints, one from the um, third to fourth century, and then another one from the tenth century. Um, so they're like six hundred years or so apart. Um, and yet we're celebrating them on the same day. Like the beauty of our faith, right? That they live um, siglos. How do you say siglos in English? <laughs> Centuries. Centuries. <laughs> My brain is a little off today. Uh, Drink more coffee. <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah. So the, the beauty of it, um, our faith that these two men, we were living six centuries apart, yet lived for the same Christ, encountered the same risen Christ, and we remember now. Like, think about we're in the 21st century, and we're, we are remembering the same from the set, uh, third to fourth century. So, maybe one day they'll remember us in the 40 some century as uh, Saint, uh, Saint Father Doug of Manitowoc. Uh. Not, not, not martyrs, but. Uh, so, yeah, we just want to talk about that. It's quite a phenomenal story. And we'll start with, with Saint George. Uh, I don't know if you know about. Uh, much about Saint George, but he's typically depicted in, uh, like, in, in a horse uh, battling a dragon. Like that's kind of like the, the traditional picture of it. Some people, including myself, used to confuse him with the statue of Saint Michael the Archangel. I thought it was one and the same. I'm like, oh, I, every time I saw someone on a horse, I'm like, oh, that's uh, and 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 killing a dragon. I thought it was Saint Michael, but now after doing some research, uh, some last night. I was quite moved by the, by the story of St. George, like the courageous attitude of, um, well, we talk about, we'll, we'll talk about the story because there's a, a legend and uh, we're not quite sure how accurate the legend is, but it's quite phenomenal. Uh, so have you guys had a chance to take a look at, at St. George? Indeed, absolutely. Um, George dates back to uh, probably born sometime in the in the mid 200s, so in the mid third century. Uh, he grew up in a time when there were still those 
around who were, were part of the patrimony of the original apostles, you know, those one and two generations after the original apostles, a very, um, you know, a very early time in, in Christianity and a time when the Roman Empire still had influence in the Middle East but was, um, was beginning to fail, beginning to fail miserably. And as the Roman Empire began to fail, its emperors became progressively more and more aggressive against the threat of this new way, this new movement of, of following the, the Nazarene, following this, this Jesus called the Christ. And there were many who lost their lives under various persecutions, but some of the most uh, aggressive persecutors were the emperors Diocletian and Decius. And we believe, uh, and again now, the earliest, earliest martyrs, because it was, you know, close to 2,000 years ago, they pick up all kinds of accretions over time with regard to the legend of their life. The question becomes, is there a kernel of reality that there was an individual um, who filled the shoes, if you will, of the person that, that takes on the great amount of legend. And good scholarship suggests that George, the, the person of George, was, was a real soul, um, and, and the legend kind of grew around him. But we do know that, that Georgius, or George, was uh, of uh, Greek origin, probably from Cappadocia, and of Christian parents, but uh, went off to join the Roman army and rose in the ranks of the Roman army to the point of, of becoming uh, more than just a foot soldier, but actually becoming a tribune. And a tribune is one who, who then, uh, be, in his military service, honors, um, has a particular honorific title given by the emperor himself. And so many times these tribunes uh, owed the, the um, you know, the, a good part of the, of the benefit of their life uh, to the emperor. And you want to go ahead and talk about uh, how he fell out of favor. Yeah, so the, there's two like waves about the story, right? Uh, let's talk about the legend first, that, uh, uh, how the legend was kind of developed about his life and his story. Um, this soldier who was courageous, was brave, uh, the story goes that um, there was this town, this place where a dragon used to began to like feed off of sheep, and then after uh, sheep it, it evolved into like having to be fed by children, by people's children, and and randomly people selected whose children was going to be fed out, uh, like whose children was going to fed the, the 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 dragon, and. Uh, uh, so it kind of evolved like that. There was this dragon eating like humans, children in particular, and uh, uh, one day this this courageous shoulder or soldier comes and um, with the help of a princess, a virgin princess, goes and defeats and kills the dragon that was oppressing the uh, people of of the time. And uh, um, the story goes that in the name of Christ he conquered the the dragon, and that he asked the people. Uh, come challenge the people that if he was going to kill the dragon in the name of Christ that uh, people were, were going to follow uh, or convert to Christ. And the story says that that day 15,000 people converted to Christianity because of his action of killing the, the dragon. And remember the symbolism of the dragon has always been a symbol of evil, a symbol of Satan himself, and that in the early days of Christianity uh, tremendous amounts of paganism uh, uh, a, a tremendous, uh, you know, there were there were pagan worshiping, uh, pagan worship going on all over, uh, not only Palestine but in the areas where the Roman army would go. And the Romans, of course, were pagans, but Roman paganism wasn't the only. There was uh, all kinds of druidic worship and and other things going on, and a lot of that worship, in reality, resulted in not only. Um, animal sacrifice, but then devolved into human sacrifice. And so this story has a kernel of truth in the early efforts on the part of Christians to 
uh, to slay the dragon of paganism, slay the dragon that required uh, the sacrifice of human life in order to be in order to be satisfied. And so George has been a military a, a, a patron of the military from the very beginning. And what's very interesting is that the, the spear or the lance of St. George that he killed the dragon with was given a name, kind of like Excalibur, the sword of, of King Arthur. Well, the spear of George was called Ascalon. And Ascalon, um, supposedly the, the spear of Ascalon was preserved. And, but what's more interesting is that if you ever go back and become a historian of the Second World War, and someone says, well, um, what was the name of the airplane that Winston Churchill used as he flew over Europe during, and flew all around Europe and, and, and within Great Britain during the Second World War? His plane was named Ascalon. Um, the, the spear that was going to, going to kill the dragon. And of course, St. George became uh, the great patron of, of the entire military of, of Great Britain and continues uh, in many areas to this day uh, as a military patron. And I think that it's, it's important that we put it in, in the historical con uh, context of, you alluded already in the beginning of, of how like, oppressive was the Roman Empire against the, the new way of Christianity developing. And uh, that they were the minority, that Christianity was suppressed, that a lot of the, the worship was happening like underground or hidden or uh, like trying to avoid um, being seen and acknowledged because they knew that the moment they were caught worshiping Christ, they were going to die. And so this context, the context of his bravery, George's bravery, not just in, in the military aspect and his courageous and being willing to like proclaim Christ and to um, be able through his witness and his courage and by killing the dragon to convert thousands of people into the faith in the midst of the oppression, in the midst of the darkness that they were living in. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the legend of St. George. Some other historians talk about the, the perhaps uh, the, the fact that he was a, a, indeed a, a knight, that he was a, a soldier, that he belonged to the the, the realms of the, the Roman Empire uh, and as a soldier for them, but then uh, was it Diocletius? Diocletius, Diocletius like found out that he was a Christian and obviously he did not want to uh, have a Christian in his army. Um, but remember, he was a tribune, and the tribunes had to play pay tribute to to the Roman emperor. Which means that every year or at some particular time, all of the tribunes in the army had to pay homage back to the demigod emperor, a pinch of incense, a little bit of whatever, as part of their fealty back to the emperor who gave them their title of tribune and gave them their, their if you will, better life than just the average common Roman foot soldier. And it was evident that George Georgius, this this, this Greek uh, Cappadocian Christian was not going to, going to disavow his Christianity and burn a pinch of incense to the emperor, and he lost his head for it. And there's other legends that say that he was tortured merciless, mercilessly uh, for, uh, for uh, up to several years uh, before he was actually uh, killed by beheading. We don't know that factually, but there is evidence that uh, that his head was separated from the rest of him in the end. But, but the beauty of like this time that we're in, that there must have been something in his heart that filled him up with courage, with valor, and, and with the strength to fight against evil and to be able to stand firm in his faith, like knowing that it was gonna cost him his own head. Um, and like the beauty that he must have encountered the risen Lord that would strengthen him, that would move him, that would fill him up. and. It's the same Christ that we are worshiping, the same Christ that we follow, and it is the same Christ that hopefully we are encountering for Him to empower us, to move us, especially in this time of darkness, that He may fill us up with that hope and that courage. Yeah, and the, our, our Gospel readings, go back and read, read the Gospels from the last couple days. Yeah. Um, you know, the, um, the, 
the, the absolute um, uh, conviction on the part of the, of the previously mute and, and, uh, and, and uh, fearful apostles now speaking with, with holy boldness and willing to give up their lives. And that same holy boldness is found in many of the, uh, most all of the, the martyrs. Uh, and George was acclaimed a, a martyr just, just by acclamation based on, on his history and, the, and the, the, the deeds of his life. And, and the, uh, the beauty, before we move to St. Adalbert, um, oh, I lost it. I must have been a brain fart or something. Uh, I had a thought. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's just a transition that we move. <laughs> Is that, is that a sign of old age? Uh, I don't know. That was rough, but it was. But it's, it's, we can move on. Yeah. There's oh, oh no! I'm a little remember, flat remember, today, huh? Yeah, I know. I am. But I remember now. Uh, this coming Sunday is the the road to Emmaus, the gospel, and this this idea that the disciples noticed that their hearts was burning uh, as Jesus was walking with them. Um, as I was doing the, the the reading and and the research for Saint George, uh, Saint George, there was something in my heart like burning with like. I was so amazed by the, the, the valor, the courage that our Lord gave them that I encourage like everyone, uh, especially males, if you're looking for a good um, patron saint, for a good role model to, to help you and walk with you and to intercede for you, St. George might be the man you're looking for. Uh, There's actually a movement of scouting, uh, not, of boy, not the Boy Scouts of the United States, but, the, but in religious scouting. Uh, and they are the... Uh, the, uh, not the knights, but the uh, anyway, they're 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 based on Saint George, and it's a it's a group of uh, of Christian Christian scouts, and maybe the knights or the 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 order of Saint George, but uh, but yeah, wow. yeah. So patron of awesome. a good model for you. Yeah, and and his Greek name is Farmer, and uh, uh, the worker of the land. Worker of the land. Yep. Is he your patron saint? Well, it hasn't farmer, been, right? but St. Isidore usually covers oh, the farmers, true, but true, he true. couldn't assist that. You're right, you're right. And now is a good time to invoke him because we're coming into the plant, we're in the planting season. We're working up the ground planting. For sure. So that's a, a great saint to follow. Uh, and I'll make <laughs> the transition, transition. Uh, into St. Adalbert, uh, right? A Polish saint. Not quite Polish, Bohemian. Oh, Bohemian. And so oh. this, this is where uh, Father Malesova, Father Mark Malesova, should be, uh, should be, if he's watching us, should be probably standing and cheering right now because Adelbert uh, is, was one of the great Bohemian missionaries. Um, Adelbert was, was, there's every good um, re uh, record of the, of the life and times of, of Adelbert and what's, interesting about him is that he was born oh roughly about uh, the year 953 maybe 954 somewhere in there um, and he was he was born into a, a wealthy royal uh, you know semi-royal uh, bohemian family and there were the bohemians uh, which would be like the czechs um, uh, were uh, at that time were divided up into ruling clans, and and Adelbert, whose actual name was Wojciech, he was he was born Wojciech. Uh, he was given the name Adelbert later on, but Wojciech was born into the Slavnik clan, which there were two major Bohemian clans that that over the years of these years vied for. For power within the within the area that was um, that later became Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, Prague, in and around that area, but but loosely called Bohemia and the Bohemians, and he was early on um, a very uh, and Christian family and and a very pious kid. But what happened was that he 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 nearly died. And, and it was attributed to prayer and the intercession of, of, of saints that, that he lived. And so his parents then dedicated him to God after he was saved from, from nearly dying as a youth. And because of that, he, he always at least had that, 
that tendency, and he had the permission of his parents to pursue religious life if he wished. Um, early on, though, he was more interested in an education, and for 10 years, he was sent to an area of Saxony called Magdeburg, which is now uh, in Germany, and he studied there under Saint Adalbert of Magdeburg, who was his tutor. And he, he was tutored by Magdeburg for, for a decade and was, um, was extremely attached to Adalbert. When Adalbert died, he was, uh, uh, Wojciech Slavnik took Adalbert's name and continued with the name of Adalbert. And he eventually um, went back to Bohemia and was made a priest in the year 9, 980, 981. And it wasn't too long after that that he was uh, made the, um, the, uh, the bishop of Prague uh, in, in Bohemia. But problems as they occur, there was always that, that interference between church and state. The, the other family, the other clan, uh, was in power at the time, and there was no way that they were going to let someone from the Slavnik clan be the, uh, the bishop or the archbishop of, of Prague. And so he was never really able to, to take his seat and he eventually had to go to Rome and appeal to the Pope for some assistance. And the Pope actually gave him quite a bit of assistance and protection, even small armies to travel with him to try to protect him, to get him to reclaim his seat as the rightful Bishop of Prague. He never, he never really got it back. And he was driven into, he could have gone into just like hermit exile, but he didn't. And, and as a displaced bishop, he chose to humble himself and become a missionary. And as a missionary, then, he went to the pagan tribes of which there were any number, and these were mostly early Celtic pagan tribes um, who would have been druidic in their, in their worship and tough nuts to crack, just like later on Patrick having to to attack or to you know, to try to convert Druidics uh, Druidic pagans in uh, Celts in in Ireland um, Adalbert was was uh, traveled throughout Hungary <clears throat> um, making good success converting the Hungarian uh, pagan tribes to Christianity and eventually making his way to Poland he was so successful in Poland that he was offered the opportunity uh, to become um, the bishop of um, uh, oh, I've lost the name of the town. Um, Warsaw? No, 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 not Warsaw. It's well, what a, is the other? G N I E Genezvo or something like that. He was anyway. He was offered the 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 um, to be bishop of, of this particular see and he accepted it and he was wildly uh, successful in Poland in uh, in converting uh, the the multiple pagan tribes to Christianity and he then continued as bishop in Poland he made one last foray into one of the untouched areas of Europe over to Prussia. Prussia, of course, is that part that where Germany butts into what would be now that Russia, kind of that, that intervening place between kind of the Russian Empire, the Rus up here, and the, and the Germans, the Saxons, and, and whatever down here. And that area of Prussia was, was that, that, um, that kind of borderland between what we now know as Germany and Russia. The Prussians were, were intensely pagan. And, and very resistant. And um, Adelbert probably was a bit uh, insistent, and some historians say that he was a bit shrill in his condemnation of the Prussians. And the Prussians 
wanted to silence him because he was beginning to, to make converts, slowly but surely. And he was eventually martyred, uh, killed, while on missionary assignment as a bishop in Prussia. He was beheaded. And then becomes, to kind of wrap up the story, what to do with his body. Um, the Poles ended up ransoming him back for, the, for, for his body weight in gold. Uh, they ransomed him back from the Prussians, the Prussian pagans. The, the Bohemians, the Czechs, had no desire because the other family, the other clan, was still in power. So they, they paid no attention to trying to get his relics back. So his relics were eventually bought back to Poland and, and went back to his second bishopric, his second Episcopal see, and his relics with his head, which they later found his head and brought that back. It, and they didn't come back simultaneously. But his relics were, were there. And then supposedly, after the Slavniks regained control in, in Bohemia, they came and raided in Poland to take his relics back but the, the, they had hidden his relics in, in Poland and they actually stole the relics of his, of his half-brother uh, who actually had gone and, and was a missionary with him and who is also a saint as well. And, and, and so they said, no, these, are, these have to be Adalbert and the Bohemians said, no, you've got the wrong bones. So even to this day, there are two shrines to St. Adalbert there's a shrine in Poland, magnificent shrine that claims to have his, his full relics. And then there's a shrine in Prague that claim to have his relics. And the Poles say, no, nope, that's, that's the half-brothers. So, so for centuries now, there's, there are two shrines to Adalbert who still aren't sure who's got whose bones. But sometime about 1923, one of the, there were two skulls even. And, Sometime about 1923, during the time of hostilities and whatever, one of the skulls was stolen and has never been found. So, so one body, one set of relics is without a skull, and the other set of relics in, has, has the, full, the full deal. So Wojciech Slavnik, uh, St. Adalbert of, of, uh, of Prague, not to be confused with his tutor, St. Adalbert of Magdeburg. That's so, awesome. And, there you have it. And, and there are, um, there, there's a particular, like, as, as I was reading this story, um, gosh, I can't think today, uh, a particular adjective that was attributed to him as with his humility, that when he went to Rome and asked just not to be the, the bishop or to be released from his uh, stuff, and he went to the monastery, um, like, that he ended up doing, like, a lot of the, the, the work and the service that was not wanted by other people like in his humility he like assumed those those uh activities uh and just think about like coming from a place of a bishop to go into a monastery to do the list of what people didn't want to do yeah um when he lived in rome he could have lived palatially but he chose to uh to live as a as a common monk and uh, and took the lowest place and essentially um, worked as the as the um, as a common uh, lay monk, essentially doing the lowest of the low jobs, wow. uh, as he was in Rome uh, seeking the assistance of of the uh, the Pope at the time to try to reclaim his see in Prague. That's awesome. I know we're we're close to our time here. Just to bring it to a close, there is uh, in his life Saint Adalbert, another powerful witness example of what our Lord does. When he touches a soul, when he pours himself upon a soul that fills that soul with, with courage, with knowledge, with humility, to go out and to proclaim his, his, his faith, his wisdom, and his kingdom on earth, and that it might have cost him his life, but he was able to do and, and can bring a lot of people into the faith. And the beauty that centuries later, 11 centuries later, we are remembering now, I know Milwaukee has a, um, a parish to St. Albert, like dedicated uh, St. Albert's parish. That's where I did my, my, my training as a seminarian. 
this beautiful old, uh, they claimed it was Polish, I think it's Polish. Yeah, because like, he's claimed yeah. by the Poles, partly by the Hungarians, but particularly by the Poles and the Czechs. But remember, Adelbert's death was roughly about 997, 997, so he would have only been 40 or 41 years of age. So all of this that he accomplished was in a very short lifespan, 40 years of age when he was, when he was martyred. And he was declared a saint by virtue of his martyrdom only two years later in 999. Yeah. So again, you see that oppression, when there's oppression, when there's difficulty, our Lord acts and empowers the soul. And so how much uh, difficulty struggles we're going through right now. That the life of these two saints, St. George and Adelbert, uh, is meant to give us that courage, that impulse to, for us to be open as well to the power of the Holy Spirit. That the risen Lord is here to be with us, to walk with us, but to pour himself in us so that we may be filled with the same courage, with the same uh, faith, with the same uh, zeal to go out and build his kingdom. So you're called to be a saint. We're called to be saints. And saints need saints to be saints. We, we, are ne we never make it to sainthood on our own volition. Um, we need the intercession of the saints that have gone before us. We need the, the help of the saints-to-be that are, are in our midst in this day. If we ever hope to be saints in our own right, we may never be recognized by the church, but once we go through the gates into heaven, we are officially saints of the church, and that should be all our goal. Absolutely. So, Father, I want to close us in a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and gracious God, may we continue to strive to be the saints that our Lord calls us to. To be inspired by the Holy Spirit, to seek above and not below. To seek our Lord, to seek our God as we journey this day. And love as the saints we've talked about, and love as the Lord has loved us. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, stay tuned today. There's a second episode of Flat Father coming uh, in. Miss Michelle and uh, Father Flat Father, me. Well, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. Did he say well, that father or flat father? Flat, 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 flat. flat, flat. flat. Okay, so there's flat. mass at 9 o'clock also. Oh, yeah, mass at 9 o'clock. And so. prayer at 4 tonight. For sure, rosary and evening prayer. God bless you.